So, today we will start the semantics of predicate logic. Before that, uh, let us just uh, quickly go through the syntax of uh, predicate logic. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we have a countably infinite collection of variable symbols and a set of terms and uh, a countably infinite collection of atomic predicate symbols and uh, we are usually interested in a signature. Uh, so, that reflects the algebraic nature of mod most of whatever we do. Uh, for simplicity, we will assume a one sorted signature, uh, where each function and each predicate symbol, atomic predicate symbol has some arity specified by these by this sort symbol S and it is uh, by this pattern basically right, where S is just some pattern. So, if, if it was a many sorted signature uh, what we would have is uh, many sort symbols S 1, S 2, S 3 etcetera as many as there are sorts uh, which is uh, something that usually is required uh, when you are dealing with a programming language because a programming language for example can be regarded as a many sorted algebra uh, based on some basic sorts like int, bool, uh, real, string, character and so on and so forth. And there are there are functions which for example, you the length of a string is a function which takes uh, which goes from strings to integers and uh, so you have uh, functions which bridge sorts. You have conversion functions from let us say reals to integers, integers to reals and so on. So, you have many such functions and predicates, but um, so uh, the first thing of course, is to realize that uh, uh, one sort uh, it is possible to view many sorted algebras also as one sorted as a single one sorted algebra in which the various sorts are distinguished by certain new atomic predicates which tell you whether some something belongs to a certain sort or not right. Uh, so, we will keep it simple and we will just worry about a one sorted signature. And uh, the other thing is uh, right, so, so this are, so this is the set of terms uh, which depending upon arity we will use the usual mathematical notation for terms in prefix fashion, but uh, uh, that is in the most general case. Uh, sometimes of course, functions are represent especially binary functions have got an infix notation, but uh, since we are interested only in trees it does not matter to us whether we are looking at it in prefix or infix, we will choose the most convenient notation yeah. Okay. Um, in then there is a particular case of constants which are essentially 0 array functions, uh, very often we will not write this parenthesis for those constants. So, and most often we will use a, b, c, d, etcetera as constant symbols. Um, this is the syntax of uh, predicate logic, uh, of which of course, the most important things are uh, these um, the specification of truth uh, for the atomic predicate symbols and uh, for uh, these two new operators called quantifiers. So, whatever uh, whatever uh, notion of semantics we define uh, should essentially take these into account and the signature in. So, with uh, the so first order logic or predicate logic is uh, a very general name and it has to be parameterized by the signature. So, we are talking about sigma formulas and sigma atomic formulas. Okay, so, uh, so therefore, it is parameterized on the signature right. Okay, uh, we will use the u same precedence conventions in addition of course, I have this uh, scoping I use square brackets to delimit scope, uh, because uh, these quantifiers they are actually parameterized on the variable, they are operators which are parameterized on a variable and that variable has a scope which is delimited by these square brackets yeah. So, in other that in that sense this collection of operations omega 1 
unlike the propositional case is actually a countably infinite set of operations to view it. So, for each variable x belonging to the set of variables v there exists a for all x there exists an operator called for all x and there exists an operator called there exists x yeah. So, this is actually an infinite uh, collection of operators and uh, uh, we will give uh, we will give the semantics appropriately yeah. Okay, so, we will concentrate on essentially these, uh, these things the usual precedence relations there are these usual notions like depth and size and sub terms which are basically subtrees of the abstract syntax trees. Um, there is this notion of variables of a term and uh, because of the fact that you have quantifiers uh, which actually have bound variables we have to distinguish between uh, free variables and bound variables. And uh, for any quantifier q, uh, where q might be either uh, a for all or there exists, uh, q x psi consists of the free variables of q x psi consist of all the free variables of psi except x, right. So, and that is uh, recursively uh, defined. Uh, so, similarly, we can talk about the subformulas as subtrees essentially um, of a formula regarded as an abstract syntax tree. And finally, uh, we will think of closures. Uh, okay, firstly, it is important to uh, state what a closed formula is. A closed formula is simply one uh, which has no free variables. And uh, um, in, in that sense, uh, the entire uh, language of propositional logic actually dealt with closed formulae. Yeah. There is also another importance for closed formulae uh, and that is that uh, strictly speaking uh, most of the theorems in a mathematical theory uh, implicitly or explicitly are closed formulae they will be expressed as closed formulae okay and very often if it, if it is implicit then what you do is usually is you have a universal closure uh, and which essentially means you look at the way the formula is quant, uh, formula looks look at all the free variables in the formula and simply put a universal closure on all of them and that is. So, so most of our theorems essentially are of this nature they are universally closed statements and that is the way we will express them. Um, some and of course, when we talk of particular cases uh, there is you can also think of an existential closure and usually uh, existential closure is made implicit in our uh, uh, mathematical theories by using constant symbols or particular kinds of uh, uh, symbols devoted to show that it does not it is not universally closed. But uh, to make these things explicit we will also define the uh, universal closure operation which essentially means that if I were to take uh, all the free variables in the formula and put a universal quantifier or an existential quantifier in front in front of the formula then I essentially get its universal closure or existential closure. Of course, there could be other formulas which are bit which have some quantifiers universal and some quantifiers existential, but so these universal and existential closure formulas are important and general closed formulas are important. Um, also um, this is extra piece of notation just to say that the predicate the formula phi it is actually just the formula phi, but this implicitly says that the set of its free variables is entirely contained in the set x 1 to x m. So, so we just borrow these extensions from mathematical standard mathematical notation and use them right. So, now we are ready to uh, proceed towards the semantics. So, one thing about the semantics of uh, predicate logic is that the language itself is parameterized on a certain signature <coughs> sigma. And so, what we would call a model or semantics for the language parameterized on a certain sigma on a certain signature sigma requires essentially what is known as a sigma algebra. So, think of it this way. 
if you are uh, if you, if you were dis to describe the theory of groups then groups have a certain signature a, a binary multiplicative operator a constant element called the identity element uh, and an inversion a unary inversion operator and so th these these three actually form the uh, operations of a group and in addition you have maybe the equality relation. So, think of it so that equality is an atomic predicate right. So, you have a group uh, in general defined by the signature of these three operations a constant a unary operation and a binary operation uh, and, uh, a uh, and an atomic predicate namely <coughs> equality. So, so, when you describe groups therefore, you are looking at essentially statements involving only elements taken from the signature terms from that signature form from that signature right. Okay. So, and what you are saying is examples of groups would be particular uh, sets let us say uh, like the integers with addition negation and 0 as identity element and of course, equ integer equality as the uh, only binary predicate symbol that is a group. So, integers under addition with the uh, unary negation and 0 uh, form a structure uh, for the signature sigma. You can also take let us say the reals under multiplication uh, well no you cannot. Uh, there is a problem there, but anyway. Uh, so you could take, for example, uh, um, the positive reals under multiplication, um, and uh, with uh, reciprocal and uh, one as identity element, and that's uh, that is a structure which uh, satisfies the same signature. Yeah. Okay. So so when you are when you are looking at statements about a certain uh, uh, statements first order logic or predicate logic statements parameterized on a certain signature then you are essentially looking at models also by models uh, by uh, you are looking at structures which satisfy uh, that that statement which are somehow for which that statement is true right. So, that is what we will. So, we will given any signature sigma we will look at a sigma structure or a sigma algebra which consists of a non empty set this non empty set like in the case of groups it might be integers or it might be reals uh, positive reals. Uh, so, this non empty set is called the carrier of the algebra uh, that is algebraic uh, terminology uh, a logical terminology is that it is the universe of discourse or it is the domain of the algebra right. So, all elements that we are considering uh, in the model uh, essentially belong to uh, this set A which is the carrier of the algebra and of course, for each MRE function symbol in the signature you have an MRE function uh, on the carrier set. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, we will just uh, so we will what we will do is uh, we will for definiteness we will subscript uh, of course, I am using the same thing my models are brown in color and uh, I will uh, so the color itself should tell you which is uh, which is something that belongs to the model and what is something that belongs to the language and of course within the language I am distinguishing between the color of terms and the color of uh, predicates so the green and violet should distinguish between them but at the level of the model uh, I am keeping everything brown in color right so there so corresponding to every violet symbol f in sigma there is a function of the same arity uh, on the domain or on the universe of discourse right uh, defined on that uh, universe of discourse. Uh, so, including uh, in the case of symbols which are constant symbols or zero array functions then there have to be identified constant symbols also in their domain right. So, in particular the identity element for groups uh, has to be identified in the domain. So, in the case of uh, the group of uh, positive reals under multiplication the identity element is 1 uh, in the case of integer the uh, integer uh, group under addition 
the identity element is 0. I mean, so those have to be identified. And of course, uh, a relation P A for each atomic predicate symbol P. I am sorry, this, this subscript A should not be there. Okay. For each atomic predicate symbol P in sigma, there is a relation uh, on this carrier set uh, of the same arity. Okay. Um, and for completeness though it is not important. Uh, in case you have a predicate symbol which is of which is 0 array, then essentially we regard that as an atomic proposition. Uh, so, which means it takes a value for which there is to be a value assigned from the set 0 1 which is our set of truth values. Yeah. But uh, this last point is just I'm, I just put written it for completeness, but usually it is not important. We never we never have a boolean constant hanging around our theory of groups I mean as simple as that yeah so that is ok. So, when the sigma algebra is understood or only the structure is uh, con uh, under consider uh, or the structure uh, or there is only one structure under consideration uh, then we will just omit this subscript a from all these functions and predicates I mean it, it tends to clutter up the notation. So, we throw that out. Okay. Uh, there are certain important things to realize here. One is that um, all these functions that we associate with function symbols are total functions. Okay. So, there is no there are no partial functions that we consider that is one thing to be noted. And uh, uh, the the only way to deal with partial functions actually is to actually uh, is to actually talk about uh, a corresponding relation instead. So, supposing you want to think you want to talk about the theory of uh, reals uh, under the division operation right uh, with equality as uh, let us say the only predicate symbol. Now, the problem is uh, normally we regard division as an operation, but division on the reals is not closed, right. Uh, so, which means that uh, and division is therefore a partial function on the reals, which means that the only way we have to deal with it in a first order framework is to actually define division instead as a ternary relation. So, if we have to deal with partial functions of arity m, uh, we will just assume that there are m, m plus 1 array relations. Okay. So, that is so in that sense we do not actually lose anything. So, it makes things a little artificial, uh, but on the other hand uh, we do not lose any expressiveness uh, because of this uh, assumption. Yeah. Uh, so, so we will treat partial functions essentially as relations and therefore, we have to uh, there has to be an exact correspondence between the signatures, uh, signature of the language and the signature structure uh, and therefore, which means that there will be corresponding atomic predicates uh, associated with uh, these partial functions yeah? and they will essentially have the meaning of relations uh, of appropriate arity uh, in the structure. Right. Um, the other thing is the other notational convention we will use is uh, so, here is a simple example of a predicate like for all x there exists y such that x is less than x plus y. I mean, so we will write predicates in this fashion. Uh, basically, uh, since less than and plus are usually used in infix notation, we will consider we will use them in infix notation. So, so here is a structure with a carrier set which is the set of naturals. Uh, there is a single operation binary operation addition and a single uh, binary relation the less than relation let us say and uh, you want to essentially uh, describe statements sta uh, about this structure uh, in first order logic. Uh, so, this is a typical statement uh, strictly speaking uh, you would write things in a prefix notation then in, they become sort of messy and unreadable. So, we will keep it readable by using in fixed notation wherever 
it is conventionally used. Okay. So, yes, so right. So, what of course, what we might do is uh, we might take the theory of integers under uh, you might take the theory of you might th take the theory of monoids for example and the natural numbers under addition with identity element 0 and what you might do is you might actually equip some other operation also i mean you might you might actually add some other relations maybe you might have a less than and then you might have a divisor of relation and so on and so forth right so uh, so, it is quite possible that I might expand the signature sigma to another signature omega less than, right. Uh, so, we would say that as, uh, so let us look at it this way. Now, if you expand the signature, uh, then the corresponding structure also needs to be expanded, right. Basically, there is, there was a need to introduce some new symbols in the signature, because you are interested in certain relations or operations uh, in that in that signature. So, you have to augment uh, the structure also with uh, with those corresponding functions or relations. Yeah. So, we will uh, we'll say that B is a structure an omega structure given that sigma is a subset of omega we will say that an omega structure B is an expansion of a sigma structure A if they both have the same domain of discourse and uh, every function symbol in A is also there in B and every predicate symbol in A is also there in B. So, then uh, and, and essentially what we are saying is that the semantics uh, the meanings of the individual functions and predicates uh, in the structure A are preserved and we are just expanding our uh, the set of operations and relations by some, some some something else. So, this expansion will be denoted uh, A triangle B. Uh, so, yeah. okay. uh, so, this is useful. Now, in the case of propositional logic of course, we had the notion of truth assignments, uh, where directly uh, atomic propositions uh, were given truth values uh, from the set 0 1. Uh, in the case of predicate logic we are talking about parameterized propositions. So, the truth of a, a proposition might depend on its parameters. So, in particular what it means is it depends upon the values of the terms that occur in the proposition. So, what we require is a notion of a valuation. So, yeah. So, we define a notion a valuation as a function v which assigns to each variable in our variable set B an element from uh, the domain of the sigma structure A. So, you have a particular model in mind let us say uh, which has a carrier set and uh, functions and pre, uh, functions and relations for the various uh, symbols in your signature and now what we do is we for each we assign to each variable symbol a value from that carrier set yeah and uh, this this structure along with a valuation will be called a sigma interpretation yeah so what you are saying is you take any statement in predicate logic and we are going to interpret it in a structure and that statement in predicate logic might have lots of free variables in which case you need some way to interpret those free variables as essentially values from the domain of that structure right. So, that is so that is what the valuation V gives you. So, uh, in, in particular so this ordered pair a structure A along with a valuation is called as an interpretation is called a sigma interpretation yeah ok right. So, um, so, given a sigma interpretation the first thing of course, is to evaluate the terms right. So, we proceed with this evaluation of terms the value of a term t in the interpretation is defined by induction uh, on the structure of the term. So, for any variable x so I have this function called v 
which takes uh, which is pa is parameterized on some. So, you are looking at the value of this term under this valuation V actually in the structure A right that is that is the way to look at it. So, uh, so for any uh, for any variable of course, it is just whatever the valuation assigns to that variable that is the value of the variable in that in a certain sense that is the only meaning of that variable. And for any term uh, f of t 1 to t m where t 1 to t m are terms themselves uh, corresponding to f in the structure there is a there is an emery function f a you apply it to the meanings of the individual terms right. Uh, so, your this is your meaning function which for uh, terms which courses through uh, by structural induction to the lowest level yeah. Okay. As usual sometimes we will write things like this just like we just like for predicates the free variables might be listed out. Uh, for terms also we might we might just the, all the variables that occur in that term uh, could be listed out or in fact more than the variables that occur in that term uh, could be listed out yeah. So, okay. so, once you have evaluated the terms, so once every term has been given a meaning in the structure A you are essentially ready to interpret all the sentence all the prop, uh, all the predicates uh, of the language right okay but before that we have something called the coincidence lemma okay this is a very simple lemma supposing you have two different valuations for the for the same structure so you you have a single structure a and two different interpretations which differ only in the valuations and for any term t if the two valuations v and v prime give you the same value uh, then essentially uh, the value of t under v is the same as the value of I am sorry this should be t here the value of t under v prime yeah okay. And uh, we will use a lot of shortcuts uh, sometimes given a term t of x 1 to x m we will and given that the variables x 1 to x m have some values a 1 to a m some constant values in this domain of the structure we will just write t a of a 1 to a m to denote the value of t of x 1 to x m instead of this more complicated way of writing things. Yeah, because uh, especially this, this coincidence lemma essentially says that sometimes we are only interested in a certain subset of the variables we are not interested in the entire lot of infinite variables that you have. So, it makes it more convenient to just write this ok. So, now I come to an important thing called a variant yeah. So, I take two valuation. So, assume that I have got a, a single structure A for a single sigma structure A and I take two different valuations V and V prime. Uh, then and let me also take a subset of the variables V, uh, a subset x of the variables V, then I would say V prime is an x variant of V or they are actually x variants of each other. If for every y for every variable that is not in x the two valuations give the same value to the variable assign the same value to the variable ok. So, by by x variance what you are saying essentially is that the two valuations um, might differ only for the values they assign to the variables in x and for all other va variables they give you the same value right ok. So, uh, very often when x is a singleton set uh, we just refer to them as a uh, singleton set containing a single variable x we just refer to them as x variants yeah uh, small x variants yeah ok. And now um, 
now we are able to are ready to give the semantics of formulae and uh, what I will do is I will not worry about the propositional connectives ok because those the semantics of propositional connectives uh, once you have got truth values is known to us. So, we so we just assume that this is true for all of them. The only difference here is that here in the case of propositional logic we had this subscript tau which is a truth assignment. In our case now what we are going to have is uh, a valuation, but so once you have specified uh, truth values for atomic propositions uh, then it is a trivial matter to uh, look upon them as truth values themselves. So, uh, and give the semantics of uh, the proposition connectives in an identical fashion yeah in an ab absolutely analogous fashion. So, we will we would not waste time on this ok. So, for any atomic predicate p of t 1 to t n under a valuation v this predicate is true if having evaluated t 1 to t n under the same valuation v, you get essentially an n tuple. So, here we are assuming that p is an n array predicate for some value of n. This n tuple of values actually belongs to that relation p a which was defined as a corresponding relation for the atomic predicate symbol p. So, if it does belong to it of course, then you give the truth value 1 otherwise you give the truth value 0 right ok. So, so this is what so essentially what we are saying is atomic uh, atomic predicates uh, they become propositions once you give values to their terms and the truth of that depends upon whether it belongs to the corresponding relation that you defined for that predicate symbol or not right. Uh, otherwise it is false. So, it is true if it if this n tuple belongs to the belongs to p a and it is false otherwise. So, in the case of this is of course, a more interesting case first is of course, that um, you for when you are intuitive understanding of the universal quantifier is essentially that phi is true for whatever value you might assign x. In that sense the truth of this uh, if this universal quantifier this universally quantified statement for all x phi is true regardless of any value that might be assigned to x. Yeah. Right. That is the intuitive understanding of this uh, universal quantifier and in the in the case of the existential quantifier the intuitive understanding is that there is a particular value which you must give to x which will make phi true. And if such a particular value does exist in the structure A then you would say that this there exists x phi is true. Okay. Note that in both cases in any mathematical theory the universally quantified and the existentially quantified statement are independent of that bound variable ok. And moreover in the case of the existential quantifier you are not actually interested in the actual value unless you are designing an algorithm for it right. As a pure mathematical statement you are not actually interested in the value. You just want to know the truth of the existential statement. So, all you need to know is that there exists there exists such a uh, value x. In particular the reason this becomes important is that uh, the, the, there is a difference between a constructive approach and a non-constructive approach. Uh, so, a, an algorithmic way of proving existence uh, would actually find a value x which would make this statement true. A non-constructive approach uh, might uh, prove it by contradiction, but assume that 
there is no value and then attain some contradiction and, and if you attain the contradiction you prove that there exists a value but since you did not construct the value you do not know what it is and yet the statement would would be true right i mean that's so there is there is something non constructive about the way we are doing all our mathematics anyway the moment you do proofs by contradiction you are being non constructive okay so so what we are saying therefore is that all these quantified statements their truth or falsity is independent of the values assigned to the bound uh, to the bound variables right okay so this uh, so what does but what, what does it mean now i have got a particular valuation v and i am saying that this statement is true if and only if i or at least i want to say that this statement this universally quantified statement is true if and only if for any value in the domain that i might assign x the predicate phi is true which means i am looking at all possible x variants of v so the free variables of this predicate phi will anyway get their values from the valuation v the bound variables do not get the values from the valuation v instead you consider all possible x variants for each bound variable x and then evaluate phi so so think of it this way if your domain a was infinite then you are essentially considering an infinite number of different x variants you are evaluating phi for all that infinite number of different x variants and you are evaluating its truth so you so in each case you will get a zero or a one but this set and then what i am saying is so this universally quantified statement is true if the product is is one right once you have got zeros and ones this product so this product is not going to be a product over an infinite set it's going to be a product over a finite set in fact it can't have more than two elements right so uh, so this so we have already defined finite products and finite sums here right so uh, so the your universal and existential quantifiers essentially are just products and sums over essentially a one element or a two element set right it cannot be more than that of course the important thing is that this these sets are not empty they have at least one element because there is at least one valuation v if a is non empty it is necessary to go back to this notion of a structure yeah this structure is a non empty set this domain has to be non empty uh, and that is that is important if you allow the possibility of an empty domain then actually except for your existential statements all universal statements would be true right so the so the domain has to be non empty and what we are saying is that empty domains are not interesting the only interesting domains are not non empty and uh, and then once your domain is non empty it implies that this set is non empty it will have at least one element especially for a uh, for v uh, for the valuation v itself oh, by the way the notion of a variant is such that uh, every valuation is an x variant of itself for any variable x right because all we are saying is that for every variable other than x the two valuations give the same value we are not denying the fact denying the possibility that for x also they might have the same value in which case they are the same valuation so every variant is act, uh, so every valuation is an x variant of itself for any variable x okay so this this so this set t phi of v 
uh, by the way this has to be V prime here in the subscript here also it has to be V prime and for every variant V prime of V uh, this set is non empty it will have at least one if your domain is non empty it will have this will be non empty also. But because it uses only truth values it cannot be more than it cannot have more than two elements it can have either so the empty subset is out so either it is just a set containing 0 or a set containing 1 or a set containing both 0 and 1 that is it. And uh, in the case of the universal quantifier the product of the set containing 0 and 1 will give you 0 anyway. So, which essentially means that it is not universally true and for the sum uh, for the existential uh, existential uh, quantifier uh, this sum will give you 1 only if 1 belongs to this set right. Okay. So, so what we have done is we have actually given a finitary definition of the semantics in a certain sense because this this set that we are considering is going to be finite. So, these finite products and so we are not we are not violating the finiteness of the definitions of sigma and phi that is what I am trying to say. Okay. So, the truth value is now evaluated under a valuation instead of a truth assignment. A valuation defines a truth assignment to a parameterized proposition depending upon the values of the parameters and this set is non empty since our domain is non empty and every valuation is a variant of itself and the number of uh, so the number of variants of a valuation equals the cardinality of the set for any variable and uh, this uh, this set cannot have more than 12 elements right so the, so we have given a completely finitary semantics though actually in principle we are we are essentially looking at finitary descriptions of possibly infinite structures yeah so if you are looking at properties of integers or properties of reals then uh, they are essentially infinite structures and when you make universal statements about them we are essentially trying to give a finitary description uh, for essentially an infinite number of properties yeah okay uh, so so that is the semantics and uh, in a certain sense it is intuitively an obvious semantics uh, and of course we can take uh, the propositional uh, uh, by including the propositional connectives and their semantics from uh, from this table uh, we essentially get uh, a full semantics for the full language right uh, but i will not uh, write that down yeah okay uh, so the other thing we should realize is that this notion of x variants uh, is somewhat closely related to the notion of substitutions yeah okay so okay so there is a particular okay so let's look at uh, so let's look at substitutions uh, I will not go into great detail substitution uh, theta is a function from the variables to uh, terms. So, we have this uh, set of terms uh, T sigma union v right okay so look at look at this notion of evaluating terms and look at this notion of substitution uh, when you apply theta to some term i mean just uh, to some term which might be some f of let us say some t 1 to t 2. Then you are doing a, re, 
a replacement of the variables in T1 and T2 by some terms. So, let us assume that this one has let us let us assume that the variables of uh, T1 and T2 are uh, the union let us say there are just two variables x 1 and x 2 and let us assume that theta of x 1 is some new term u 1 and theta of x 2 is some new term u 2. Okay. So, what we are saying is that so you take this substitution theta and essentially this will give you syntactically a term f of some other let us say g of u 1 and u 2 and maybe some h of u 1 and u 2 right. Okay. You look at valuations, valuations are functions from v to essentially the domain. Okay. There is some connection between valuations and substitutions. By so the effect the effect of a substitution, so under a valuation v. So, if you evaluate this theta of f t 1 comma t 2, then under some valuation v, then the effect of this substitution theta can be captured by another valuation v prime such that if you evaluate v f of g u 1 u 2 g uh, h u 1 u 2 under this valuation v prime then these two values are equal. Right? Okay. So, there is some connection between substitutions and valuations. Notice that valuations are in the semantic domain, substitutions are in the syntactic domain. Right? So, so, you take any substitution, its meaning can be expressed in terms of a, a higher order function on valuations purely semantically. Yeah. So, there is a function on, so corresponding to each theta, there exists a, f a function h from the set of all possible substitutions theta to the set of all possible substitutions theta, such that h of theta under v is equal to some theta prime under v prime. Yeah. So, this is the connection that we need to establish between purely syntactic substitutions and their semantic counterparts namely valuation. So, each substitution can think can be thought of as a function which actually transforms valuations from one to another right. Uh, so, we will formalize this and we will prove some lemma before we proceed ahead yeah. So, this is a concept that we need to formalize and this will become this will be useful for a full description of then if, if you can do this if you can specify this function h then you have essentially completely captured the semantic notions of valuations in terms of the syntactic notion of substitution and the two can mutually interact. Yeah. So, we will look at this in, a, in the next lecture. Yeah. We will stop here today.